It's my pleasure, and it's also really exciting to have this self-selected, super interesting bunch of people in the room. So um, I'm, uh, I've actually uh, been uncharacteristically daunted by trying to imagine what all I would tell you guys. Um, because for many years, I've been doing this for a long time, as Lauren said, and uh, for a long time, what I was talking about was aspirational. It's like, OK, culture and biology have to get together somehow. That's how it has to work. Um, but especially in putting together this talk, I've been um, really impressed at how far we've come. And th so this makes it a particularly exciting moment, I think. I think for us to um, engage with the kinds of um, questions that you're interested in, in ways that really capitalize on both theory and method um, that has come so far. So I'm going to try to weave this through as, as in the presentation this morning. Um, also, I have uh, what might look to you like an unduly long list of readings. Um, but these are things for you to refer to. They're online. And I'm going to weave through those particular readings as I go along to use them to illustrate the points that I'm making. So I'm really going to try to combine theory, because I, I think theory is super important, um, uh, as it is in conversation with evidence. Uh, and so we're going to try to do that as we go along. Um, oh. All right. If I turn this on, it'll help. OK. Or maybe not. I'll just use the arrow. All right. So uh, one of the readings um, is talking about the interface between culture and neuroscience. And um, it's all too easy in many ways to um, analyze the limitations of neuroscience. And I think that we're really, um, those of us in the room anyway, are keenly aware of those limitations. Um, and so we're, what we're going to be doing, though, over the coming week is really, in many ways, thinking through some of the insights that we have actually gained through neuroscience um, as it is being brought into conversation um, with other disciplines. Um, so the limitations, in many ways, of um, what neuroscience is dealing with, I think, can actually be an opportunity. So this is one thing that I want to invite you to do, is um, very often, because I train mainly in anthropology. It came from basic science, went into anthropology, and learned to critique everything to death, right? Um, um, but one of the things that is important is to um, critique and yet then say, so now what? What are we going to do next? In the case of neuroscience, then, or with any method that we're using, thinking through its limitations, because any method, any paradigm is going to have a limitation, thinking through the limitations and then working with those limitations. And as we're go I'm going to talk about, one way to work with it is in conversation with other ways of looking at the same phenomenon. And this is where the biocultural dynamic comes into play that I'm going to be talking about. And so, uh, as I said, it's easy to be critical. On the other side, and um, we are making attempts to bring the, d the technology into the field. This is the latest, and I can't say that it looks any more user friendly um, than that fMRI machine. Um, but I, uh, while what I'll be saying sometimes will appear um, critical, I also want to say that no matter um, what we do, we're always just approximating what people, um, what's actually going on with people. And so I learned this really early on in my career, where I thought I was going to do better and differently. I came, you know, loaded with the the bio part and loaded with the cultural part, and was working on um, reproductive health. And we did a very, um, this is the early 90s. Uh, we did a really elaborate study on the relationship between breastfeeding practices and um, interbirth interval, which was a big deal in those days. Um, and it, this is working in the northern coast of Papua New Guinea. Uh, we did elaborate stuff with energetics and looking at breast milk production and double labeled water and hormones. And uh, we came back after a couple of years. And so this, this kid had been in the study 
um, and we're talking to one of the moms and um, excitedly telling her about you know the project that you were in. This is what we learned about this. You know what you guys are doing is is spacing births in this particular way, and. And I love this comment, uh, which actually is reflected by another anthropologist, where she heard very much the same thing. But you know it is right what you say, but it is not the way we think. So in other words, I was presenting one layer of reality, which is this is what's going on with the biology. Um, this, is not, this is not necessarily coming into consciousness for them. We're worried about birth spacing. They're worried about infant survival. That's what they're worried about is, are their babies OK? Are their babies doing well? And so this, for me, is kind of a touchstone in terms of and going back and forth between um, layers of knowing. It is what comes to consciousness, what is in people's minds is important, but it's not the only important thing. So how to go back and forth between that. So going back to the fMRI machine, what we're dealing with then is, and there is a limitation here, in that we have a person. So uh, we've got a person who uh, we're looking at their behavior, um, but the behavior is extremely limited in the sense that it's mostly, sorry, it's going to be what's in their brain. Um, and so that's one thing that I want to encourage you guys to think about is, um, to actually then continually think about what's going on with the rest of the body. Because what we know now is that embodied cognition um, is, is the way things work, right? And so just looking at what's in the head, an easy fix for contextualizing what's going on with that person is to actually look at the rest of the physiology. And increasingly, people are doing this. Um, but then the other, of course, is to think through context. And there are multiple layers of context that we'll be talking about over the next several days. And so the con immediate context, um, a lot of work has been done to um, engage people in tasks uh, and interactions in the context of the machine. And so there's a great deal of work around this. Um, but actually, I invite you as, because the readings that I gave you are, I think, fantastic. There's a lot of fabulous work going on. But it's a, a look at what you are told about the participants. And also look at um, what labels are used to designate the participants. And there's a remarkable paucity of information about the people who are in these machines. Um, and so I want to encourage all of you who are doing uh, work um, of this kind to really then think about, well, what, who are these people who are coming into the machine? Likewise, for those of you who are coming from the side of cultural anthropology, this is one of the huge areas where we, there's a, you have a lot to bring. Um, because we can learn a lot from, about context and link that to people who are then um, going into an MRI scanner. Right? So this is an exciting area, I think, where we can um, start to build those conversations. So that's sort of a lead in. And uh, what I'm going to do today, then, is, is take a developmental perspective, because that's what I tend to do. But um, also, I think that approach allows us to build a kind of life course, lifespan um, approach that um, would be congenial with the sorts of things that you guys are interested in. Um, but uh, I'm going to build this through the layers, actually, that Lawrence was talking about at the outset to talk about a little bit of evolutionary history um, and, then, um, and design, because the focus here is that um, the biologist side of me finds it incredibly useful to think about what is this organism designed to do? What is what is it? What are the problems that we're equipped to do deal with well? What are the ones that we're not equipped to deal with as well? Um, so the, several of you are working on um, uh, technologies that are novel. Um, are these indeed challenging? And what are the particular challenges that they represent that our design is not necessarily um, equipped to deal with? 
So we're going to um, go through a bit of life history theory because uh, I'm going to show you how useful that can be to actually generate hypotheses that you can test, but then also um, to interpret data that might not make sense otherwise. And then we'll move into, um, through this, to really understand how embodiment then works. Why, why is this a, such a powerful site for us to understand? Um, the sources of hu not just human well-being, but also the sources of uh, dysfunction. Um, and then I'm going to end with um, looking at um, how all of these come together um, to help us begin to see how there are some, I won't call them universal processes, but general processes that are actually set up to produce local solutions. Um, because humans are a weed species, we have ramified in, throughout our history uh, into all kinds of settings. And so plasticity and adaptability are part of the design. So that's our plan. Um, but I'm going to start from a place that I think will be comfortable for all of us, and that is the recognition um, that it, none of us is born alone in the world. Um, rather, um, we're all born into a world of culture. Uh, and in the many, much of the time we're probably going to talk about, uh, hopefully not get down in the weeds about what is culture, um, but uh, to think about uh, how, how it works and what constitutes it. So, Commonly, people think about culture as beliefs and values um, and meanings. Um, but uh, another thing to um, know, if you don't already, is that because very often when you say the word culture, people get a little glazed over. It becomes like a black box. Um, but actually, um, culture is, cognitively anyway, is not just a bunch of set, uh, a random bag of beliefs, values, and practices. Rather, they're organized into models and schemas about how the world works and how, how we then can act appropriately, how we can interpret what's going on with other, other people. And so there's an organizing structure, a set of logics that shoot through any cultural um, matrix. And um, those logics then um, really shape the behaviors and the daily practices um, and the products, the room that we're in, for example, is a cultural production, right? Um, and so the setting that we're operating right now then is a cultural frame. And it's from this logic, and it's really within psychological anthropology, that fairly early on, actually starting with Franz Boas, there was a focus on context, on environment. What, are the, what is the setting in which individuals are operating, and how does that actually the setting then shape the way people function and behave. In the case of human development then, uh, there emerged the idea that, uh, or the recognition, um, that this infant, for example, does not sort of randa, randomly grow up in a human setting. Rather, it grows up in a series of very specific settings that are, that are shaped by um, the, not just the culture in general that it's in. So those of you who come from Canada or Turkey or Brazil or whatever, you didn't grow up in Canada or Turkey or Brazil. You grew up in a series of settings that were highly localized that represented a slice through um, that, that culture um, and a series of um, actors who were then shaping the experiences that you had. And so we're going to try to sort of take that set of ideas from uh, psychological anthropology and sort of follow that as, um, a, as it helps us to understand what's going on with neuroscience and, and even mental health. But the idea here then is that um, uh, every culture then has a notion of um, babies and what they need and human development and how folk, how, what parents should do to foster child development. And so again, 
that, that set of notions about what children need, what parents should do, are, shape the context in which the kid grows up, and that these are then often consciously, too, and uh, in many ways unconsciously, structuring the outcomes um, from the developmental process. Um, and one of the things that uh, is a sneaky aspect of culture, right, is that all of this gets naturalized. It, it is often going on outside of consciousness in the sense that, well, of course we know what to do. Of course things are the way they are. And we're going to look at that in the context of a couple of uh, interesting examples. Okay, I'm trying to. But I, as I said, I want to back up from that story that I just told you about human development to then think about um, our evolutionary history and why things might work that way. Uh, and uh, biocultural theory has sort of permeated studies of hu human evolution for a long time without actually being formalized in a very good way. Um, the idea there was that um, humans started uh, using tools, um, and well, they became bipedal, they started using tools to shape the brain, it shaped what was possible to do, um, and that there was a ratchet effect between um, behavior and biology um, at, through time, and that's what made us human. Um, so to make it more specific, the idea here then is that uh, you, have a, uh, you have a biology that gives you a particular set of capacities, right? Um, but that uh, culture is another way of uh, communicating capacities, right? So this room is full of affordances. So all of those devices that you have, the chairs that you're on, the tables you're using, all of these then are affordances that are allowing us and also constraining us to behave in certain ways, right? Um, and so the, the convergence of biology and culture is really what's um, shaping behavior because um, if it isn't possible for us to learn these things or if it isn't possible um, to enact certain forms of knowledge, well, then uh, this dynamic wouldn't work. And so the biology and the culture have to work together to then um, allow us to be effective in the world and in this model anyway, to meet selection pressures, right? To uh, flourish and survive and reproduce in the world, which in other words is enhancing fitness and is going to drive evolution in terms of shaping um, the, the favoring the genetics that allowed us to engage in this kind of, of dynamic. Uh, the thing here though is that it, the, very often the focus has been on genotype. And what I'm going to be arguing using the evidence as we go along, and for many of you, maybe a foregone conclusion, but sometimes constructing the narrative is really important, as Lawrence was saying. The focus has been on genotype, and that's the definition of evolution. Well, what we're undergoing now is a, rec is a real change in our understanding of evolutionary process. And, and this is based on an old dy a dynamic that we know from way back, which is that actually natural selection operates on the phenotype. It doesn't operate on the genotype. And so um, the capacity to adapt, in other words, to meet specific environmental demands, um, the, the capacity for adaptability is actually selected for. So th what the genotype is doing in many cases is on the one side ensuring that the things that shouldn't change, like you should get one head and two hands and two feet, right? So the basic bow plan needs to come through. <clears throat> but in many respects, the environment is going to tell the genes what it needs to know in order for you to function appropriately. And so uh, now we're all excited about in gene environment interaction, but basic Basically, that's where it's at in many respects, right? Especially if we're trying to understand uh, humans. So the reason I'm showing you this, don't worry, we're not going to go through all those million years, but um, uh, that actually it, there has been a huge focus on the brain in understanding human evolution. 
And that, in some ways, uh, has eclipsed um, understanding other things. Um, but what I want to point out to you here is that that neat model that I was telling you about where you know, we become bipedal and we start using tools and then we start foraging in a different way and that makes us smarter and smarter <clears throat> turns out not to be the case. That bipedalism actually happened way before tools happened and then tools happened and we were still and humans expanded all over the globe and they started to get bigger. Still the brain isn't getting all that much bigger. And it was really, it appears to be in a fairly late phase, well, late in the last 800,000 million years, um, that this brain expansion happened. And this appears to be in the context then of a great deal of cultural elaboration that we're still not entirely understanding. But it, in other words, um, our brains, there's, this is kind of sending us a big signal um, that there's a, there is a ratcheting effect, um, that it appears to be cultural, and um, we're still not trying to, uh, we're still not clear exactly what goes in there. Is it language? Um, it looks like that might be part of it, um, but it may have to do with social dynamics, the use of fire, and so forth. But so the focus on the brain has left out some other things and that I wanted to draw your attention to here because um, when we were talking about that baby, <clears throat> the baby is in the social context, right? And the social context is parents and caregivers. And actually, as it turns out, it takes three generations. For the the hunter-gatherer folks have figured out finally that um, human reproduction doesn't add up calorically. It takes um, three generations to do reproduction. Um, and so a big shift across human evolution was, was expansion of longevity, um, which actually occurred fairly late. Um, and what this meant then is that you have a reservoir of adults who are available for taking care of kids and also doing all that culture stuff, right? So big shift here uh, in terms of the demographics. And that intersected with um, an underlying biology um, where the, the human brain, yes, is unusually large, but it also um, has a very distinctive postnatal trajectory. And, and the one that folks were impressed with for quite a while was that incredibly steep trajectory in the first two to five years. Um, and this is where the whole global focus on the first thousand days and the importance of the quality of environments and care and health uh, for little kids um, comes from because um, things that affect brain development here are really going to have long-term effects. What I would like to point out to you, though, we're not going to have time to go into that, is that uh, we're now into talking about the second decade. It isn't just the first thousand days. Development doesn't stop then. Um, but actually, there's some really, so here's the difference between quantity and quality. That is, there's a bunch of wiring stuff that goes on um, in puberty in the second decade uh, that turns out to be really important for a whole lot of things. And by the way, for those of you interested, um, and global mental health, it's over this period that the big psychobehavioral um, challenges appear. And they're not all just the result of early experience. So <clears throat> what we essentially have then is an organism that is context expectant. I, I, like, to th I like that phrase. Um, because if you think uh, of um, the developing human and actually just humans as context expectant. Um, this helps us to sort of appreciate the, the openness and indeed the dependency uh, that human ha humans have, the interdependency um, on the context. Um, just even for something as basic as wiring our brains. We need that input and throughput, for example, in the visual system to wire it up. Um, and it, I'm using the brain here because we're doing neuroscience. I'll talk a bit more later on about the immune system, which turns out to be another really cool system. I invite you to pay attention to that system as you go along in your studies because it is another major 
communication system. And, and it runs all over the body, does a lot of stuff with the um, nervous system. And so um, it's another one of those systems that is blatantly context expectant. The immune system learns to be competent um, through exposure. So <clears throat> I'm saying context expectant. And the model that I showed you before was kind of like culture, and then things happen. Um, <clears throat> and this isn't the only model, <clears throat> but I wanted to not walk you through it necessarily, but to um, give you a sense that um, one can operationalize the things that I'm talking about and try to lay out then, all right, what do I think is going on? So I would say, honestly, one of my biggest problems with, um, well, this, we're talking about neuroscience, so many imaging studies, is that very often the model is so tiny, it's not very interesting, right? I mean, in terms of like, what are we trying to understand about human cognition? Now, I know you've got to get it down to the point of, what do I expect to see um, in the scanner? Um, but actually, having a larger model about what you think is going on and being, being very planful about what do I think, uh, for example, um, if I'm looking at a child trauma, for example, um, where did that trauma come from? So what's going on in terms of the, the powerful moderators, so parent characteristics, family relationships, I'm going to show you some stuff about that. Um, household contextual things. So it's like, OK, I, I'll, here are the things I can look at or not. Um, <clears throat> and then also, what is it, what's going on with the kid? Uh, and again, we have some really nice gene environment stuff that we already see differential vulnerability. Um, and because then, if I'm going to be looking at something as specific as what's going on in the brain, it's really going to help a lot if I have a better sense of um, what it is I'm really testing and what that information is going to tell me about how humans function. And I would uh, suggest that that's going to help us a lot in terms of the translational challenge of how do we understand how um, some of the imaging stuff relates to, say, a mental health problem. So I'm going to one of the readings, uh, not going to go through the details of the study, but here I wanted to touch briefly on um, the title of this workshop is about cultural, social and cultural neuroscience. And <clears throat> not to get down in the weeds about what's the difference between social and cultural, but actually I do, uh, in my own mind, I don't know about you, make a distinction. And I think it's easy to be sloppy about that distinction. And however you want to draw the, draw the lines, I think it's important to think about this. This is a study about um, uh, uh, an imaging study uh, done by um, a social uh, neuroscience anthropologist in my department, Jim Rilling. Um, <clears throat> and it, it has some really nice combination of methods. So one is the um, EAR, the um, uh, electronically activated recording so that you have snippets of naturalistic um, uh, sound throughout the day um, and you can analyze those sounds for all kinds of things. In this case, we're looking at child-directed speech from the father and the content of that speech. Um, but then also they're using um, uh, stimuli, uh, putting fought these fathers in the scanner, um, and presenting with stimuli that on the one side are their own children, and then uh, also not their children. And looking at responses to um, uh, brain responses um, to uh, those child images. And what he found was that, in this particular case, the dads are um, relating to their daughters. There's more active engagement. They're singing more to them. There's more analytic language. And they have more emotion talk to their daughters. Whereas boys, there's more rough and tumble play. There's a more achievement language, get, making your goals. Um, and they're responding to the neutral faces of um, boys. And they're responding more to the happy faces of girls. So, this, to my mind, is about social behavior. Right? It's telling us about social stuff. Um, and I'm not criticizing uh, this study. 
Um, but what it does leave latent is our question of is the question of culture. Right? What is the model? What is the model about child development? What is the um, model of gender differences and is that latent? Is it conscious? Um, and so very often when we say we're looking at culture, we're actually looking at social behavior. And we still haven't asked the question, how does that get back to um, the cultural logics that lie behind this? And even more so for a number of you, you're, you're interested in the structural pieces, right? Why was this dad able to relate in to the child as much or in the way that he did? Um, it begs the question of that. Um, but that's fine. We've got to start somewhere, uh, and it's a cool study. OK, so I've been, I said at the outset that um, I really find thinking about design um, to be very valuable. Uh, and for that, actually, when people uh, think about evolution, um, there's, there's a whole line of theory um, and evidence that is often overlooked. Uh, and this is life history, uh, which is if, if you look at these um, creatures, it's actually a really interesting question. What, what makes a mosquito a mosquito or an elephant an elephant? I mean, this is a huge deal, right, of what, what evolutionary histories led to this. Why, why do we have this? Um, and basically what life history theory says is that, well, each of these organisms has a set of ways to be in the world that is capitalizing on a particular niche. So a mosquito has a particular niche. Elephants have a particular niche. And what they're essentially doing is using resources through time in a very particular way. Right? So it's, it's a mosquito or a butterfly uses a specific set of resources within an environment um, and it's pacing the use of those resources through time to build a life, basically. Uh, and in life history theory, the life is, this is evolutionary guys, right? Um, that you've got to grow, you've got to get to a certain size, you're going to reproduce, but you've got to stay alive, that's maintenance. And uh, I think this is really important and useful because um, it also helps us to really get up and be serious about constraints, because many of us are interested in things like poverty and inequality um, and the things that constrain people. Um, and a lot of this is the lack of resources or the skewed nature of resources that are forcing certain kinds of choices um, on individuals. The focus very often when people think of, especially if it's in behavioral ecology, but outside of evolutionary stuff, is, is to think in terms of, oh, we're talking about material resources. But for those of us, especially you here in the room, the big one is information. Information is a huge resource. Uh, and our central nervous system is just one of many big systems that we use um, to collect information about the environment. And again, culture then is another big information capturing distribution stream. And uh, very often then when people are, are disenfranchised, it isn't just material resources. It's social resources. It's very often information, um, ways to know how to function. OK. So, this stream of research has been out there for the last um, 40, 50 years. And what's interesting is that independent of this, um, or developmental psychology came along and started to see phenomena that are very, would be, that made the life history people very, including me, very happy. And so uh, it, the, the biological embedding phenomenon um, was made, uh, actually Gilbert Gottlieb, if you don't know his work, fantastic stuff, really about how information gets transmitted um, in all kinds of ways. He studied ducks and showed that um, learning to be a competent baby duck and attach, whether you believe in that or not, but be a competent baby duck starts embryonically in the shell. And in a normal world, a baby duck will have a quacking 
ducky mom, <laughs> who's sitting and dad, who's going to be sitting on it. And <clears throat> in other words, that the biology was context dependent. Really great theoretical and empirical work that he did. And Michael came along and, and um, is still doing phenomenal work um, on first rodent models and now looking at humans, um, a whole um, a whole panoply of developmental psychologists also um, got into uh, looking at how early experiences then uh, shape uh, the functioning um, psychological development and then increasingly um, um, mental health and physical development, uh, physical health. Uh, and again, this idea of a biologically embedding of experience. Um, and uh, then going even further back to realize that these things start in utero. So Gottlieb had done that with ducks a while ago, but then it took a little while and folks started to realize, right, that um, there's um, information transmission about the harshness or the goodness of the world that is transmitted um, uh, during gestation. And now, of course, people are working on Inter intergenerational uh, pathways of transmission. That's the whole developmental origins of health and disease. So um, that's, and hopefully now then you're beginning to get a sense though of why, from a perspective of um, life history theory, um, this makes a whole lot of sense, right? Because what we're seeing is examples of how organisms have um, built in um, ways to channel development uh, using information about the environments in which they are currently functioning and are likely to function in the future because mom is representing or the context are representing the environments in which you're likely to be having to survive in future. <clears throat> So a lot of this was um, initially oriented to um, then sort of cognitive, psychosocial, stress type experiences. Stress and trauma was a big focus. Um, but I wanted to give you this example because um, it, uh, it was coming out of um, uh, my, my work of looking at the impact of low birth weight on physical health and survival. And so I was a collaborator uh, in the Great Smoky Mountains study with Jane Castello and Adrian Angold for, and this is a big longitudinal study. And so just I uh, told Jane, uh, I want you to go look at the effects of low birth weight um, on risk for depression. Because this was, among many other things, this study was oriented to try to explain uh, the dramatic increases in rates of depression, specifically among girls, not so much among boys, um, that occurs in the second decade. And uh, to my surprise, um, although that's well, sometimes theory actually is true, um, it was the low, we did find increases in depression, but it was really the low birth weight girls who were carrying all of the effect. There were um, uh, not so many differences between normal birth weight girls and either low birth weight or normal birth weight boys, um, it was really those girls who were low birth weight. And you can go, okay, fine, but here's the cool part. Uh, there was actually a sensitization effect, and this is gonna be driving the sort of things that I'm gonna be talking about now, which is that it isn't about that those early experiences set you up, and that's it, that's how you're gonna respond in future. What you do is, is in many of these systems, you potentiate a differential response under certain conditions, right? And so that's what we saw here, which is that, um, surprise, we know this, right? That when bad things happen in your life, that's the number one predictor of risk for depression, the most proximal um, predictor. And indeed, we had really intensive information about exposures to all kinds of, st of stressors and risk factors. And as those risk factors went up, so does the um, prevalence of depression in girls. Um, but what essentially happens if you're a low birth weight girl is that there's a sensitization effect. You s shift the curve of response to the left. 
In other words, it takes a lower threshold of bad things happening in your life to, to, to become um, depressed in this context. Um, so here we have an example. So there's a site we've, with Meany and other folks, Gunner and so forth. There's, there are psychological cues. There are social cues that are telling us what's going on. But also the body is doing a readout. So low birth weight is about, also about information, resources, what's going to be available. And so I'm going to be tracing these kinds of interactive effects now through, um, in fact, I'm going to set this up, and then we're going to take a break from 10.30 to 11, right? So I'll just set this up to get us started on interaction, and then, and then we'll come back in half an hour. Um, and, and so I want you to, over the break, hopefully just chat and relax, but also think about how interesting this is. Um, so this is early work by Caspi, big battles we know about MAOA and, and any of these allelic variations and what they really do and mean. Um, but uh, what we're looking at here is, um, uh, the, this is their Dunedin study, right? And so uh, they're looking at child maltreatment in that big longitudinal birth cohort that they have. Uh, and none uh, likely, but not necessarily reported, and then reported and severe. Um, and then these are, um, they have a variety of measures of antisocial behavior. And we can already say, well, hmm, here's some culture stuff going on here. What's antisocial, right? How do we, how does that get labeled? Maybe it's likely a good thing to do under certain circumstances. But anyway, begging that question, um, they're getting rated for levels of antisocial behavior by childhood maltreatment. Um, the dominant allele is, um, gives you a high MAOA activity, high being relative to the subdominant allele. Um, <clears throat> and it shows you that, indeed, as childhood uh, maltreatment goes up, yes, yeah, surprise, you, know, you get an effect on antisocial behavior. But in the subdominant, less frequent allele, um, which gives you lower MAOA activity, um, these individuals are more sensitive to the environment. That is, um, they're, they're showing much higher rates of antisocial behavior than are these individuals who have the dominant allele. And so this is the thing we focus on, right? We, I do, too. We study risk, right? Uh, and I'm going to end if we get that bar this morning, talking about resilience, too. Because look at the other end of the curve. And Steve Sumi had had some really interesting stuff on his monkeys earlier on, um, showing a similar thing that uh, these alleles very commonly are associated with a benefit under good conditions and um, a cost under crummy conditions. And so there is a bigger variation across a quality of environment um, for this less frequent allele. So um, if times are good, you, get, you either no effect, you don't pay, or very often you do better. And then um, uh, there was a cost under those other conditions. And this led uh, Tom Boyce, who's another, if you don't know his work already, very nice work over decades, looking at these similar dynamics in kids. Uh, mainly focusing on, on physical health. Uh, but he came up with the idea of, of dandelions. That, that is, these guys are designed to be robust, right? To, to do OK, even when things are pretty crappy, or at least you, know, you notice that it's not so bad. Whereas um, these, it, they call the orchids, so this is a sort of orchid and dandelion approach, which is that <clears throat> orchids are fabulous. We love them. They're great. Um, but they do best under certain conditions. Right? And so I'm going to leave you with a break with this thought, which is this allelic variation is all over the place. right? So all those transporters and receptors and um, enzymes that regulate uh, neurotransmitter turnover and production um, show variation. And humans are, um, have pretty high levels of variation as well. So we're going to be following some of that variation when we go into the next session. So that gives us a half hour break. Um, and 25, 25 minute break oh. according to my clock.
Okay, sorry. <laughs> 25 minute break, and um, we'll, I'll take like five minutes at the beginning for, for comments or questions, so um, be ready with that if you want. Thanks. So you want to keep going? I, I have a question. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you said in the beginning of your uh, talk that um, uh, you wanted to use the limitations of neuroscience to, mm -hmm. instead of just criticizing them, using mm -hmm. uh, them to kind of enrich the field. So right. could you give me an example of how we could do that or how, yeah, or just a practical example of like instead of only criticizing, just using limitations to go further, I guess? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I, I, I'll probably sh I'll show you an example um, later on. Um, but one of the things is to really operationalize the variables. So very often, so you could say, for example, if you're interested in ethnicity, right? And um, in fact, I think I'll get to that right at the end, is whether the default mode network looks different if you are um, in a uh, individualist versus an inter, um, what do you call it again? Collectivist, Collectivist versus individualist. Are, is, this, is your um, insula going to react differently if you have a collective view versus if you have an individual view? Mm -hmm. um, so, you could operationalize that. Sounds really neat. We know the DS of what it looks like. Um, DM, DMN, right? We know what it looks like. Um, but then you have to say, wait, ethnicity? So actually, what is collectivist? What would be a representative of that? Um, what would, who am I going to put in the scanner? Mm -hmm. And what am I going to know about that person that is really going to get me to where I want to go. And that is going to make me think much more deeply. And Shinova has been doing this for years and lots of other people as well to sort of really think about what am I talking about when I'm talking about that mode of relating to the world. Um, and so that's what I meant. Is, and then, then it would get us, and there are several of you in the room who would be able to contribute to really thinking carefully about self the, and the construction of self and um, how we think that might get represented. And then, again, what do I want to know about the people that I'm putting in the scanner? Because actually, it maybe won't be ethnicity, ultimately. It might be some things about the construction of self that you really want to be looking at, and you want to pick people along some axis like that. Mm -hmm. Does that make some sense? Yeah, I guess I'm still struggling with the idea of like, okay, so you have these people in the scanner, and you want to compare groups, but it feels like no matter how you want to categorize, it's never gonna, it's never gonna be okay because every person mm -hmm. is so different in its own way. So mm -hmm. whether you look at culture or ethnicity or other factors, it's, it's still gonna be very challenging to compare these groups, mm -hmm. um, especially if you consider uh, the differences, mm -hmm. but I, I think it's also I need a little bit more time to get around how to like practically yeah. get to it. Yeah, uh, because then uh, like very often what we're interested in, okay, uh, I, I came from basic science, went into anthropology, and um, learned about its racist roots too late. I mean, I arrived in graduate school and, oh my god, I can't believe it. Uh, and, um, and so I confronted my advisor and sort of like, ah, I think I'm in the wrong place. This is like, oh. Um, and he said, no, no, no. We're not, we got over just studying difference. It's the differences that make a difference mm -hmm. that we're interested in. And I thought, oh, okay, that's fine. I get along with that. Well, it's like, wait a minute, that immediately gets you into cultural stuff, right? Because why does stuff make a difference? It makes a difference in, in a context. So I think that can be an important thing is to really, especially for m many of you, we're interested in the bottom line. What What is people's quality of life? How um, can they accomplish the things that they need and want to accomplish and mm -hmm. feel reasonably comfortable? And uh, so some of the differences are going to wash out. I mean, human variation is all over the place. Yeah. And 
what in it is meaningful? And I'm not sure that consoles you a whole lot, because then how do you decide which are the differences? But that's often what we're looking at here, as I find anyway, is that, um, like, OK, another good example. Back in the day, there were good genes and bad genes. There really were. And there are still a few of those. But there are not so many around, because if they're that gene is so bad, then mostly gets eliminated in the process of evolution. So what we used to think of as bad genes, and we're looking for candidate genes for schizophrenia until we're blue in the face, it's um, that those genes are doing a whole lot of other things. And so we really have changed um, our, our that, that would be another example of how digging into um, what looks like very mechanistic stuff gets us to a larger, larger insight about how things work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Sam, you have a comment or a question? No, no, thanks. I, I really wish there was time to comment on every single point you raised. It's <laughs> I just, yeah. uh, I have a, a comment and a question about the last couple of slides. Mm on the questions of finding the relevant factors that modulate uh, environmental sensitivity. Yeah. Um, I guess, as someone who also trains an anthropologist, I'm really interested in, uh, I guess, cultural and generational differences in that as well. And sometimes yeah. I wonder if the, the valence of an event mm. um, can, be, can ever be intrinsically good or bad or stressful outside of the normative cultural concept context that assigns it as such. So in other words, mm. say if we expect to be slapped by our parents to be a good thing, maybe it's a good thing, right. maybe it's a bad thing. So I, I really wonder if we right. can talk about this in any culture-free way. Yeah. That's a really big question. The more specific <coughs> question that I had is, again, in the context of what seems to me like the current public culture in which um, we talk a lot about trauma, we talk a lot about adversity, we talk a lot about risk factors, um, and I wonder how applicable that is universally to the human experience. And I wonder if you know of any study where too little adversity also leads to, um, to increased environmental sensitivity, you know, in a way that would be hmm. relatively uh, culturally universal. Asthma. Peanut allergy. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, those are the obvious ones. And I guess you're thinking about the mental health equivalent of that and <clears throat> um, I think that's why a lot of us are, are it. the reason that immune system came immediately to mind I'll get around to it at the end is that it's so tightly linked to mental health stuff so what's going on with depression today and I, I'm sort of reminded this is a bit but for those of you who are into contemplative studies there was a Rinpoche who came over from Kathmandu and um, he was giving a teaching and um, and afterward, he said, oh, you guys, you know, your minds are like Cadillacs. And I tried to understand what he meant by that. It's like, well, we all, you know, good nutrition, good health. We've got these buzzing brains. Um, and that really made me think about, well, if we evolve and actually nutrition wasn't always that wonderful and health wasn't always that wonderful, is this is our our brains a bit like that immune system that's you know all revved up and looking for trouble? I, I don't know. But anyway. Are we turning into orchids? There are co cohorted studies of uh, uh, the cohort of people that went through the, the Great Depression actually had less depression uh, right. uh, as they aged than uh, than younger people. So uh, so it's it's not individuals and it's not exactly neuroscience, but there is some, some suggestion of data in that cohort, uh, uh, data of people that went through the Great Depression. Yeah, and actually I'm forgetting the name. There was an economist who came out with a paper, it was like three or four years ago, um, um, tracking, um, and I forget how he tracked health uh, indicators, but actually in, in the US in the 20th century, and when the economy was doing well, people's health got worse, and vice versa, because, and, uh, and because they were able to engage in all kinds of health risky behaviors, um, alcohol, smoking, uh, driving more cars, et cetera. So I'm not sure that's getting exactly to your question. But I, I think it's, this is a good thing to have out on the table so years now. ago, Hans Selye wrote about new stress, you know, the mm -hmm. optimal level of stress for, for development. Maybe there is a kind of over-cushioning kind of an 
hyper concerned that gets in the way of having adaptive flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at least in the U.S., the psychologists are actually trying to have that conversation out there with hyperprotective parents who think that an ideal parent is about the child never experiencing adversity. And, and so you get these psychologists who are quietly trying to say that maybe a little challenge would be an experience of failure. Um, uh, yeah. This is also an interesting question for critical neuroscience because um, as, as a culture we have particular ideas about what constitutes depression and vulnerability and then yeah. we have, we, we read of the studies that say low birth weight you know, is linked to increase with depression, you know, the potential nocebo effects of reading these studies concern greatly because of the high epistemic authority of mm -hmm. these medical studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we tried to control for everything but I still have the everything being, you know, family environment, inter, you know, maternal everything, parent everything. But uh, you know, the environment that produces that low birth weight child persists into the reality that also produces a res results in a depressed girl. So but my concern was for how the cultural model, the idea that oh, if, if I was a low birth weight girl, therefore I might be at higher risk for depression, right. that belief itself yeah. might be a risk factor for depression. Yeah. Yeah, well, there are various layers of, right, exactly, yeah. Um, yes? Sorry. Uh, this also relates to that. So I'm interested in, like, how, like, the public interpretation of these scientific findings. So, like, as mm. people in academia, like, we're constantly surrounded by these ideas, but, like, years before I started university, like if someone told me about this, I would have no idea what they were saying. Like I would still think of science as this like authority of knowledge, right? Mm. Um, providing us with the universal truths. So I think like, I know there's probably no one answer to this question or like if it's gonna be hard to tackle this question, but like how can um, like people within this field like neuroscience or science in general uh, kind of like tell the public and make it known to the public that all this is situated and that like all this is very context dependent because as you were saying before like just the fact that you say like low birth, low birth weight in girls leads to higher depression like it does have an, an influence mm -hmm. on the person itself right mm -hmm. like just that knowledge so, like, yeah i mean i think uh, yeah, this is we'll talk i'm uh, we've all we all deal with this all the time just one comment to make is that humans discovered zero a few thousand years ago probability 19th century. So probability is not something that humans do well with. But we've forgotten about that, right? And we think that a probabilistic space is like, oh, that's just how one, no. <laughs> and so um, I, I, you're putting your finger on a very important social cultural dynamic because um, a certain model of knowledge, which is, as you said, the truth, uh, it, it is popularly inscribed in various ways and reinforced by the way some scientists behave um, and others like to use science. That's the other, the social use of science. And then um, how th that expectation, if it's not met, leads to the belief in there is no, every truth is constructed. It's all up for grabs. Right? So that's, I, I'm happy to tell you I don't have a solution to that, <laughs> right? But it's good to get that on the table. Well, and, and we have some interesting historians here where um, I'll be curious uh, over the time whether, we, have we learned anything from history? Is there, you know, get, how might that speak to your question? And I think you, and then we'll. It's just a small comment or question about uh, wealthy societies. Because something mm. that's present in wealthy societies is this constant reward. Mm. And so when we constantly reward uh, people and our brains, then the brain areas mm. involved in the reward are the same parts of the brain involved in addiction. And it's known mm. that people who are soliciting these parts of the brain are more prone to depression. Mm. So you know, there's a, maybe a fine line that is um, not as not that mm. clear between rewarding a child to make them happy and rewarding a child in a way that their addiction system will get triggered. Right. So I mean, 
this is talked about in the economics literature in terms of the hedonic treadmill. Mm -hmm. It's very much something that's part of how our society and how our economy works. Right. Right. And it, it subverts intrinsic motivations, which can be for many other reasons. You know, the interest one has in something or the feeling of whatever you know, connection to other people that doesn't have to function the same way. Anyway, I, yeah, addiction to constant stimulation, too. So I'm just going to turn right around and feed your addiction a little more. <laughs> and, um, and thank you for the comments. So um, we're going to talk then about how these, these sort of dynamics play out um, uh, and um, playing with some of these background contextual um, factors. And I'm just reminding you of uh, some of the structural components because, again, um, wh what I'm going to be moving into now is um, not just social dynamics, but also structural factors um, that are playing into the kind of uh, person environment interactions that I was just talking about. And so um, pointing to then that very much of the time when we're talking about um, um, the Apparently, I, if I use sorry, if I use this pointer, it's nice for the recording. I'm not so sure that it's nice for my mouth hand coordination, but anyway. Um, so I think I can. We're used to um, really thinking of social dynamics um, down at this level, and then anthropologists may push up to this level. Um, Economists and some anthropologists and uh, sociologists also like to talk about structural factors. Um, and it, one of the issues is that very often we've got one element or the other or a few elements, but it's very difficult to put them all, to, all together. And so um, I wanted to uh, give you some examples from the reading that, um, that I shared with you to sort of start walking through some of that. So. Um, and I think this is why the term embodiment has gotten so much currency. Hopefully by now you have a background that gives you a sense of why I think embodiment happens, right? That the organism is designed that this is going to happen. And also the context in which we're operating um, work with that premise of, um, of, of culture gets under the skin. Um, and so this is an example of um, Ah, and of what I was telling you about earlier, which is that um, the that culture is not just a grab bag of stuff. Rather, there there are identifiable models or ideas about all kinds of domains. So that organize the field of knowledge and of action. And so similarly, then um, if it's about caregivers. Um, then it's going to be their sense of how you should treat their infant um, with respect to these remote goals. So humans are often thinking about, um, as Lawrence said, things that are happening or may never happen, but uh, remotely into the future. Um, and that when we talk about development, we're also then um, often making the child a passive a recipient of this. And so um, I have never done it. I think actually um, no one else has to actually ask children about their models about development. What do they think children need and how do they develop? But anyway, we do um, have studies that ask adolescents about that. Um, and this is a really nice study that was done by Elizabeth Sweet um, uh, and colleagues where she was uh, working with adolescents in Chicago um, and talking with them about social status. One of the most important things for adolescents, especially in the setting where we're operating here, where you've got everybody in school, same age, um, mixed gender, peer situations, um, that social status it becomes an enormous preoccupation. And so what she did was ask them about what, what is required for social status. How do you get social status? What, how do you know who has um, higher or lower social status? And they were able to come up, uh, the kids had a very clear model of what was required. And uh, we've seen this repeatedly as well in, in similar work, that it's a combination of material things 
and social things. So the social things were like hanging out with friends at the right kind of restaurant, um, being on the track team. The material stuff was about having the right phone, having the right shoes, and actually right down to the I, uh, not just you know cool shoes, but they had to be K-Swiss uh, shoes. And so the specificity of this model um, was so great um, that one could almost think of this as cultural coercion in the sense that um, it, it was a very small eye of the needle of what would constitute um, status among these kids. Um, and so I'm going to show you then a method that a number of you may be familiar with, but some of you may not, but actually has proven to be very useful if you're trying to sort of unpack um, the culture box and particularly get at the cultural models that I was telling you about. Um, and this is, was developed by Bill Dressler. It's called Cultural Consensus. And what we're looking for here, it doesn't mean necessarily that culture is coherent, because it's not entirely. Uh, domains often don't match up. Um, but uh, when we're looking at a certain field of action, if um, that field of belief is informing action, um, we ideally should be able to disembed a shared sense of this is how things work. This is what one should do. Um, and the reason, the logic behind this is that it's a very cognitive view, but it's that we need to know what others are going to think and do so that we can act accordingly. So I want to emphasize this because we could define culture in a lot of ways, and we will over the week. Uh, but in this view, it's a very cognitive view. It's about what people hold in mind. Doesn't mean they're always conscious about it, um, but it's, it's um, what informs how they think about things. Um, and, and is based on this idea of schemas and models. And it's pretty straightforward and actually pretty efficient. Um, and it's a great way to just um, get out there and talk to people because the first thing you do is you do one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, you talk with a range of people to try to get at themes in a domain. So in this case, you would be talking about, you know, well, um, I've heard that social status is, is a big deal here. What, what does that really mean? You know? um, we've often found, too, that focus groups can be a way um, to sort of ratchet up conversations. And um, a combination, then, of focus groups and individual interviews can be a way to go. And you do this iteratively until you come to saturation. And you begin to have a sense of, oh, it looks like uh, either like this is multiple domains, or there's this going on, and these are the kinds of dynamics that are in play. Um, these are the words, terms, logics that uh, are involved. And you put together a survey um, to get at that domain. Um, and you give it to a community sample, so it should be drawn from the same community where you'd be wanting to do your work, but not the folks you're going to have in your study. Um, and, and you see if it hangs together. You see if um, the, there is um, consensus in the sense of basically just a factor, fancy factor analysis, where there are things in that domain hang together. Um, and you sort stuff out if it's irrelevant. Uh, you may have to do this a couple of times to sort of really see whether you get to um, uh, mapping a domain. And so once you achieve, once you get to a point where, yeah, I think I really got a sense of um, social status, in this case, huge um, sample convergence uh, on, on the set of things that it goes into status in this case. Um, you then turn around and you give this interview, so it's a survey again, um, to your target sample. And now what you're doing is you have an answer key which comes from your community sample, right? So this is what the community out there is saying, um, uh, in this case, what's involved in getting social status. And you ask, in this case, kids, um, do you have case with shoes? Do you have this so-and-so cell phone? Um, you look for um, consonants. So to what extent is that individual achieving, um, achieving, whatever, having um, the ingredients for um, cultural compliance, as we could call that, 
fitting in to the cultural model. And so um, consonance then, again, means, that, this is pretty interesting, right? Because it says um, that, that, yes, culture is shared. We might have a sense of what's involved. But there is not in a level playing field, necessarily, and the extent to which people can live out that cultural uh, model or schema. Um, and, and consonants, as Bill has shown through, Bill Dressler has shown through um, years of work, um, is actually a potent driver of um, mental and physical health. And so in this particular, and I'll show you one of his studies in a moment, but um, this is, uh, Sweet then is drawing on this background to look at kids who have high status consonants, okay? So these are the kids where we would say they're doing what the local culture says they should be doing in order to achieve um, high status. And it's playing this off um, against um, uh, background information about parent income and uh, education. Uh, and occupation. So they've got a co combined measure of, of SES, and uh, they've split the sample by lower or higher SES, and we're looking at blood pressure, uh, which in, in, this mo in this series of work that Dressler started has been a powerful um, indicator of these dynamics. And what you're seeing here, if we're just um, looking at um, we'll start with the high SES kids, okay? So if you've got resources, um, then if you are um, able to achieve, if you perform the cultural model, then um, your diastolic and systolic blood pressure is um, much lower than if you are not um, able to achieve. If, for whatever reason, if you're not performing the cultural model, you may resist it for whatever reason. And you may think that this difference is not very much, but actually um, at that, um, the, this level of difference has actually been at that age, so this is seven, 16, 17, 18, has been shown to predict to adult um, cardiovascular issues. So it's, these are actual differences that make a difference. Um, <clears throat> But then, now, we get to the lower SES kids, that is, the kids who don't have the resources. Um, there are kids who don't have the resources, but yeah, they achieve that. They, they get the shoes, and they do the track team and all the rest. And, and they do it, but they pay for it in blood pressure. And this uh, <coughs> literature coincides with a long literature in the US that's quite separate uh, on John Henryism. Uh, and, uh, but then also, if the kids who have low resources and um, have low consonants then, um, actually, it, in terms of physically, maybe not so much socially, but actually physically, are doing somewhat better. Okay, so we're seeing these sorts of, now we're not talking about genetics at all, right? We're, in this case, we're really talking about family conditions, so it's resources in the family, um, external conditions in terms of a shared model of what's, what's required for social competence, um, and then the interactive effect um, on uh, uh, blood pressure in these kids. So that's in kids. Um, but this goes on throughout life, right? Um, and so uh, often we're looking at adults and we're looking at the cumulative effects of this structural stuff, uh, cultural stuff going on. And so um, this is another paper that um, you can refer to that we've logged in, a really nice piece by uh, Lance Gravely. <clears throat> where he worked in Puerto Rico, where there is a very clear cultural model, a lot of ethnic diversity, um, a lot of heritage both from Europe and from uh, Africa, very little, uh, none, indigenous um, at this point. And it, there is a, he could extract a clear cultural model um, based on uh, skin color, face, hair, um, used a series of 72 photos. So again, I'm, I'm 
I posted those papers so that you could kind of go in later on and sort of look at how people did this stuff. Uh, so it would give you a sense of some of the different approaches that people can use. Um, and so using these pictures, he elicited in a similar way with the cultural consensus I just told you about, um, that there are a set of categories of blanco, trigueño, and negro that are applied to um, ethnic categories uh, within Puerto Rican society. Um, and what's pretty interesting is he partnered with um, geneticists to um, get at African ancestry. You can imagine there are a lot of caveats around that. You can read that section of the paper. Um, but <clears throat> what you see is that, yeah, there are distinct um, um, genetic profiles in each of these groups, but enormous amount of overlap. And so then we can talk about what kind of, what. So here would be an example of what you were just asking me about, right? You use this to then go back in and dig in on how did that person wind up being trigueño? What was the key factor? Or um, you know, what was the key factor here? Here you could work across the range of variation to really try to dig into what constructs color. Because color is an important cultural category. And we might be using that category if we were doing um, research of some kind, right? Um, and what he also did was um, then uh, go in and uh, take a sample um, they self-assigned um, by um, group. And, but then they also were externally assigned. And what I'm showing you here is um, the uh, external assignments by two raters who were using this system. Um, and uh, I'm mapping for you that Trigueño and Blanco sort of behave very similarly. Um, same sort of model. So you could see Swede actually modeled her, her study and, and the analysis on um, this earlier Gravely piece. Um, and if, uh, again, we look at what are viewed as higher status individuals, Trigueño and Blanco, that if, so this is um, that adult individual's SES, right? Again, a composite category. Um, so you have lower blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, if um, you are higher status and you perform higher status in the sense of you have um, higher SES. Um, if you can't, that's, that's where blood pressure is higher. And the reverse is true, the same sort of pattern we saw in the other study um, where um, uh, higher stat uh, high SES, negro individuals, were paying for that more in terms of um, blood pressure. And again, we could get under that to sort of say, well, all right, uh, how do these categories then operate to construct those differences in this in these biological profiles. Um, hello. Okay. Um, and then here is a really re recent paper by Dressler. Uh, if you want to track the stuff, he's been working over about 30 years, uh, and has uh, linked um, both physical and, in this case, we're looking at the mental health side of things. Um, because finding that individuals who, who know the cultural model, they know what's, what's out there and what's desired, but are not able to perform that, are much more vulnerable um, to depression. Um, and so here, um, uh, recent work in uh, his sample in Brazil. Uh, so this is um, uh, middle, medium-sized town slash city. Um, and their model up here, well, let's see if this, it's only working fitfully. Um, their their um, model is that uh, genotype, in this case then, is going to be sort of a mediator. Um, that is, that the genotype of the individual is really going to, uh, in some ways I would say moderate, but anyway, change the relationship between childhood adversity and um, your performance as an adult. Um, because uh, socioeconomic status, we've been, uh, many of you already study this, um, affects the risk for childhood adversity. Childhood adversity has been linked to um, risk for um, depression and um, 
and, and we'll talk more about the, the social uh, behavioral effects. Um, but he's focused on one of the core uh, domains in um, social life um, for Brazilians, which is family life. So um, one of the core achievements through the life course is around family, around your relationships with family. Um, this beats um, professional or even economic achievements, but having and building and cultivating uh, family and family relationships is, is core. He's found this um, uh, through over 20 years of research. And so what they're looking at here um, is um, the, it's a, a serotonin, not the transporter, yeah, serotonin receptor uh, variation. And these are the, this is the dominant and the heterozygote uh, individuals. And then these are uh, the subdominant um, alleles. And uh, what he finds is that under conditions in lower income neighborhoods, so where stress is higher, right? So it emerges only in lower income neighborhoods. And then we could ask, why are, how did people wind up in those neighborhoods? Um, but individuals who had experienced um, high childhood adversity um, and have this um, recessive genotype are more likely to be depressed. And we see the same sort of crossover effect. Those who um, uh, have the dominant allele are, it actually doesn't, that level of childhood adversity in this context does not have the same um, sort of effect. Um, and it, what he, in, in their mediation analysis, found was that this effect is because, seems to be linked to, their ability to achieve consonance in family life, in meeting the cultural expectations for having and cultivating a, a family. And if um, you were, had experienced low levels of childhood adversity, um, and you have this genotype, um, you're actually it's, this is significant, this difference. You can see the low variance. Um, you were more likely to be able to achieve um, consonants in the supervalued domain. But if you have high levels, um, then you're much less likely to be able to do so. So you see um, that, uh, for those of you who are interested in the mental health then, that there's a con context effect that's concurrent, but that a background structural effect having to do um, with one, exposure to adversity, and um, two, um, the, uh, the, mo the cultural model. And so what's really cool in this paper is saying, OK, we found at least three layers of context. And if you were thinking about the, if you think about the models I was showing you earlier, so one, there's socioeconomic status. So culture is constructing that. Another is this cultural consonance, the importance of family, family life. Um, and, and, um, and so what is going to constitute consonance? And then lastly, it's the family life itself, and, and that includes the individuals in it. OK, so um, uh, the net effect here, and I think that's why um, uh, we are some of us are not surprised that we're finding a lot of these dynamics, um, given the background that I told you, um, is because of, again, the person-environment interaction that we're designed to engage in. And so we're finding that, that genetic variability is, is widespread, as I told you earlier. Um, and what's going to be interesting then is also to then, not just to think about, oh, you know, this gene does this under those cir circumstances. But there's very little actually looking at the frequency of these genes and um, actually the extent of the variability and then um, actually uh, even compositional effects. So um, in terms of niche partitioning, could it be that um, you want an ideal mix of people with different um, uh, genetic um, complements to, to actually fill all the social niches um, that we've got? Um, and so um, the, if we're thinking about risk then, 
um, these interactive effects are something that we're going to have to expect. Um, and um, if we're really going to understand them, hopefully this gives you some ideas. All right. <clears throat> so segueing over to, um, to uh, another way in which culture operates, and we get the sort of um, biocultural dynamics. Um, are, it, it, I've already alluded to, um, the developmental trajectory, just even if we look at the brain. Um, and societies then, um, consciously or unconsciously, and we, I'll show you some conscious examples, um, are taking advantage of these trajectories. And again, that can be really interesting in terms, for some of us, in terms of how does a society construct the ecologies through which individuals move or how they allocate those ecologies. So some people get into these spaces and other get, people get into those spaces. And how does that actually affect um, outcomes? Um, and so we're all familiar with this, which is this huge dominant cultural model that we have, that that developing brain is what education is for, right? And so we fill that brain with, um, with learning. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a product of education. I, I professionally do formal education. Some people get a little outraged when I point this out, that formal education is really weird. In the history of humanity, not. So putting a whole bunch of kids in a room and having you know, butts on seats and you have to state regulate for hours at a time uh, is just N not the way things have been. And, and this has been globally exported, right, at, as, as a, cultural mo a cultural practice um, without a whole lot of reflection um, of, well, what is it we're actually doing here? And um, our, as we export the model, uh, what were some of the, the hidden assumptions behind formal education in the Western cultural context that may or may not fit well with what we think it's doing elsewhere? And I'm just putting that out there um, as, as a question, because it's really not thought about a whole lot. Um, and so education, formal education, is a practice. And um, we could analyze it as such. Similarly, and that's where a number of you have gone into this, is um, that um, human suffering has always happened. And so every society has various practices that are associated with ways to prevent or alleviate um, physical or mental um, suffering. Um, but also, there are many practices that um, uh, are oriented to um, helping people acquire the kind of knowledge and skills um, that they need in order to um, pursue a certain life track. And so as some of you know, these days I'm doing a lot of work with uh, Tibetan Buddhist monastics. We're part of a program that um, is working with them on their interest in science education and how Buddhism and science can sort of talk to each other. And that's been really interesting to me because it has also pointed out some uh, very consistent practices that are very highly elaborated that we have left long behind. And one of them is memorization. So if any of you is interested, um, I want to see the brain on memorization and how that's different um, from from the way that we do learning, because memorization requires um, intense uh, focus, repetition, and the monastic faculty uh, regard it uh, as, and the advanced students regard it as a form of meditation and, and learning self-regulation. So that's a practice. We could study those practices, right? You can be thinking about the context in which you're working and sort of saying, well, what are the practices that happen all the time that are actually shaping um, the kinds of dynamics, in this case, of the way that memory is acquired and stored and accessed, um, how learning gets associated with um, attention regulation um, and uh, self-regulation in general. Uh, but another cool thing is, you know, what we're doing right now is it's so pacified, right? We're, you're sitting in seats, and I'm talking 
I'd like to think with you, your minds are busy and engaged rather than at you, but still. Um, uh, what this tradition also does is, is say, that's fine if you've memorized the stuff. But now you've got to use it. You've got to enact it. Um, and of course, we do this all the time, right? Uh, we try to use the knowledge that we've got. We go out there, and we talk to people, and we behave, and we learn how uh, what we're doing is appropriate or not. But we don't do this as much in the educational setting. And so again, um, a practice, a very clear practice that has some very clear goals goals um, about learning and the acquisition of critical uh, thinking, um, that, that we could be thinking about what does that do? How does that work? Um, so I'm not going to get into this a lot, because this kind of study of practices, and the, the, I think some of you will be doing it, actually, um, uh, is, is also another way for us to get under the skin of understanding um, biocultural dynamics. Um, as they affect human functioning uh, and differential well-being. And the reason this stuff is so potent, um, oh, yeah, and I want to say one more thing, which is that we have, a, I have, a way of exceptionalizing this, right? So I call this a practice. Debate is a practice. Um, memorization is a practice. Formal education is a practice. Well, you know, every day of your life is a practice. That is, you're getting up, you know, you sleep in a certain way, you get up a certain way, you get around the world in a certain way, you relate to people in a certain way. Um, all of this is practice. And um, based on what we know about neuroplasticity, you know, you're constantly tuning um, your brain and body. Um, through these continual practices. And this is this really nice NIH cartoon um, that sort of gets, we know a ton about this, right? Here is a good example of how all that sort of really molecular level of neuroscience is giving us a different kind of appreciation. It's really transformed our sense of uh, not just memory, but our sense of how, how, we, how we know. Um, and that actually knowledge then is embodied, um, not just in our brain, although this is a very brain-centric model. Um, and, and, and so I want to put this out to you guys, because you know, these actually we know all of these things, and again, life, um, are things that uh, affect the brain. So uh, you know, there's, we have an embarrassment of riches in terms of um, ways that we could be examining um, how um, how the mind works is shaped through a variety of ways um, to live. Um, but uh, I wanted to uh, take us to a space where it's not my comfort zone, I have to say, because um, I'm not a heavy meaning um, analyst. Um, but meaning, obviously, is a huge part of um, what we would be talking about because um, stress has it in here and emotions has it in here, but it's like we separate them out. Whereas we know that uh, cognition or an experience are constantly merging these two, and that um, the attempt to understand um, meaning is is really at the core of how we try to get at the nexus between um, what what's going on inside, and then what's going on outside. And we know also that, both in terms of mental and physical health, that meaning um, really matters. And so uh, I, I, for one, have gotten super excited about um, cognitive um, sciences and um, how to ally um, the techniques from the cognitive sciences uh, with uh, field work, particularly. And I think Kathy uh, will be talking about that later this week. Um, by now, everyone has seen a screen. And so people like, like Jeffrey here looking at you know, how folks are using um, those kind of screen-based online experiences, um, uh, how that affects them. Um, and so we could use, um, anthropology has been really slow, um, to use some of these techniques to, um, to um, actually try to understand 
cognitive processing in very different settings. So we do have experience sampling, and people are using this more and more. Um, we also have um, uh, remote sensing and uh, monitoring, um, you know, to the extent that by now we can know so much about what people are doing uh, that there are serious ethical issues um, involved as well. Um, but it, I think this is a really um, exciting area that I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of examples about, except that's why I included um, the piece about thinking too much. Um, so. Uh, for those of you who are psychiatrists, how many of you have encountered that in your in your patients, where they just they talk about thinking too much as a complaint? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Just for other people to see, it's all right. You're a psychiatrist. <laughs> so so several of you have, and um, maybe does anybody want to say? Something about what what you know? What are they complaining about when they're complaining about thinking too much? You want to say? For example, I have listeners who um, you know whether they have diagnosis or symptoms of OCD, for example, mm -hmm. obsessive compulsive. They just could not get themselves out of the these kind of fixation. So mm -hmm. they're talking about rumination. Mm -hmm. They're kind of thinking about I mean anxious about anxious, right? They're thinking about you know. The more they think about it, they, they, they less the chance they get out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's about they thinking a lot. They just cannot sleep at bed, you know, before bedtime because they're thinking, thinking, thinking about what's mm -hmm. going on during the day, what's going on, you know, what will be, you know, the next day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But mm -hmm. that's, that's part of the complaints about the OCD and other anxiety. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, what's pretty interesting is that. Um, um, we certainly found out in the GSMS that anxiety, and many others have as well, that anxiety is kind of prodromal for depression in many cases. It doesn't always lead to depression, um, but often the anxiety comes first, and then you see the depression um, later. Uh, and it, it, the thinking um, a lot comes up again and again in the ethnographic reports about um, um, mental health problems. And so there's been a recent series of papers that are cited in this one um, where they're pulling together that evidence and going, oh, wow, you know, this is really, um, whereas uh, before, um, uh, when Susan Nolan Hoeksema, like, what was that, 30 years or so, was really showed the importance of rumination, at least in girls, as leading to depression and that, that important role for rumination, um, it hadn't really been moved out to kind of think about um, how does that play out elsewhere. And it turns out um, that we see this repeatedly in many different settings. Now what gets interesting then is that, um, so we, we have this thinking too much, but, um, and what um, Devin Hinton is arguing is that um, there are some, I don't know, we would call it universal generalizable processes that nevertheless have very local content. And so that's part of what I'm going to be wanting to end our time with this morning, is helping us to think toward um, how there might be general mechanisms, I'm not saying universal yet, but general processes or mechanisms that then are underlying in a dynamic way the production of diversity. Right? And this can help us um, to have our cake and eat it too in terms of getting a handle of, on where this diversity comes from, what are some underlying processes moving beyond categories of culture or genes or something like that, but looking at the processes and then seeing how those become localized um, to help us understand, unpack the diversity that, that we're looking at. So what Hinton argues is that, um, <clears throat> that there uh, that these ethnographic reports uh, seem to suggest the following kind of processes, which is you start out with some, some negative stuff, something that's not working in your life, um, that puts you in a bad mood, right? And um, uh, the 
bad mode uh, can, if you're so inclined, can interact with other stuff that may push you to start having some depressive symptoms. Um, it may increase your blood pressure, let's say. It could do so transiently. That's OK. Um, but um, also, this negative mood then um, alters the way you respond to um, experiences. And so uh, many people have talked about this in terms of reactivity, right, or hypervigilance or hypovigilance. So um, it's your disposition, the way that you are um, uh, translating what's going on around you. Um, and it, uh, uh, I think we've all had that experience where um, we'll, um, you know, we're driving down the street with our, with our friend in the car, and somebody cuts us out, and um, uh, you know, nothing terrible happens, but it's a really bad move. And uh, you may be pissed off about this um, briefly. Um, but then it's like that goes by. But the, your friend in the car is still talking about that later in the day. It's like, I can't believe this person cut me out. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there are differences in how we respond to just we're in the same space, same thing, but that can be in a very different um, emotional dynamic space um, is, is part of what he's talking about here. Um, and so if, if you are... Um, you know, mellow and relaxed, uh, you're going to respond differently to the people around you, um, make um, calmer decisions. Um, and actually, we know the underlying neuroscience for both of these things, right? Um, that, that the dysphoric arousal that, um, that is, is being driven by this can have just little tiny effects. That's what he's saying at the outset, just little effects. But that this stuff can compound. So if you're not interacting as effectively with others, if you're not feeling as good about things, making as good as decisions about things, this may lead to more negative stuff that's happening in your life. Um, and that compounds with things that you're worrying about, um, things that, negative stuff that um, you may have experienced before. So the, here is kind of the fuel. Um, so what is? Um, the baggage that um, you may come with in terms of previous traumatic experiences or negative experience or not, as the case may be. Right? Um, and I like that he included anger here because um, uh, that, that's an important emotion that uh, when we talk about negative emotions, we're often focusing on the depression, but frequently depression comes along with anger and hostility. Um, so he's saying you get this dynamic that's driving, starts driving, that you really get, start to get caught up in this stuff that's driving the negative mood, that's driving more somatic symptoms and um, um, mental symptoms. So you may start to feel um, you know, really hyper alert or really like um, things are not going well. You're monitoring your behavior all the time, watching for um, mistakes that you may make or watching others for what they might do to you. And he documents in some really nice way, uh, ways, and we see this in other places that, I mean, I've shown you already how blood pressure can, can be affected pretty pretty readily under some of these conditions, but a variety of somatic conditions that um, relate to ability to regulate attention, um, visual, uh, and he gave a variety of examples of, again, how this starts to be very culturally um, bound as well. Um, and as these things build up, what he found uh, was showing clinically, he and others, uh, is that this leads to catastrophic cognitions, which is, you know, I knew it's not, you know, it's all, things always go wrong, and, um, you know, I'm losing it here, or the world is out to get me, and all of the above, maybe, that then really fuel the dysphoric arousal, um, drive this some more, and then feed back into um, more thinking a lot. So he's putting that out there, which I think is going to be interesting for other um, uh, cross-cultural psychologists, psychiatrists to, to look at as potentially um, a way of thinking about what's fueling, um, what's behind this repeated appearance of thinking a lot in a variety of settings. 
which, however, plays out in different ways, even in terms of uh, the symptoms um, that are involved. So again, this idea of general processes that may lead to um, local um, specificity. And so um, uh, there's a really nice paper that um, it was just posted electronically, uh, Journal of Youth and Adolescence, um, where it, they're showing that um, uh, anxiety in adolescence. Um, it's a two-year follow-up study, and they were uh, they did a bunch of immune markers and a big psychiatric workup. Um, at uh, the kids are on average 16 and a half years old, so that's going to put them at 18 and a half. Um, two years later, and um, uh, all of these kids um, had anxiety to start with, and what he found was that. Um, the um, anxiety, the levels of anxiety, um, the extent to which those levels are associated with IL-6, that is, um, inflammatory response, um, predict at baseline, predicted um, their, their probability of being depressed two years later. So in other words, when he's talking about somatic symptoms and these sort of dynamics, um, these, these aren't really separate, right? It's, it's the mind and the body working together. Um, and the immune system in this case is really that, that interface. Um, and again, it's not just going to be IL-6 that's going to be driving it, but really interesting it's going to look at. So I thought, uh, particularly for those of you who, uh, who are, and a number of you are interested in um, global mental health, uh, that it also uh, nice to look at that paper in terms of the series of studies that they did to sort of get at um, what's going on in a, a Vietnamese uh, immigrants slash refugees um, in the US. And so uh, in one study, they looked at the frequency and the timing, just the phenomenology, right? Like how often does this happen and, and when does it happen? Um, uh, because you then can say, are there triggers? Are there settings that, that trigger these kinds of things? That can be really helpful for understanding. Again, it can be very culturally based. What are the triggers? Um, also, what are the safe spaces? Um, so again, Kathy, I think you might be talking about that later this week, to really be thinking about literally a social and cultural ecology of experience, and where do people feel safe? Where do they not feel safe? Where are the triggers? Um, where are uh, the sources of resilience? <clears throat> and then they did a really nice study just to look at content. So what do you, you know? What what's in there when you're when you're ruminating or thinking too much? Um, and and what do you think this is about? Where did this come from? What does it mean? Uh, helping them to understand what is the cultural model that these individuals are going to be using for interpreting their experience. That's really important, right? Um, <clears throat> and then uh, to get at what are they s ha helping them to sort of see what are these symptoms. Um, and there are actually two interesting levels. One is what they just say. It's like, this is what I have. The other is to actually, and one of you mentioned phenomenology, that's a really, you know, Husserl and all the rest, I mean, that's a really interesting area um, that, that uh, some people are trying to put back in there in terms of what, what can um, uh, a first person or even a second person account look like in terms of the phenology, phenomenology of what goes on in the mind. So one is just what do people say? How do they talk about it? The other is to try to walk them through that. And it's like, what is it, you know, how, how is that feeling now? Because uh, again, that's a lot of culture work just goes in there um, as people are experiencing. Um, and then what kinds of fears, um, what's, what, what are the emotional loadings on all of this stuff? What's, what's making this negative for them? Um, and then what are the ways that, uh, what are the local treatments? And again, really nice in terms then not just of you know which kind of curandero do you go to, but um, what 
what are the sources of resilience? Do you go and find your friends? Do you um, go to do you go to the local temple? He, they found that there are some really nice Buddhist affordances that uh, Vietnamese are using. Um, and then um, the last is historical processes. In this case, um, looking at the colonial history that was also providing a set of narratives about mental health um, and the sources of mental illness. And who was using those? Turns out educated folks were using them because they had been exposed to that colonial education system if they were older. And older individuals who had not been educated, we're using a different uh, set of uh, models to interpret this. So um, hopefully that, that sort of, I think that's going to be a really interesting area to continue to explore. And a bunch of you already here are doing it. But I want to get back to this point about thinking. Um, <clears throat> And this is another area where um, the cognitive sciences have really, really given us a lot to think about and work with. Um, and that is that we now know that you know, a lot of what our brain is doing, um, especially with it using the default mode network, is simulating stuff. Right? running models of things. So that's the way we remember. We remember by running that simulation. Um, when someone is talking to us, um, this is activating parts of our brain. You know, see the, you know, the cat ran across the street. You're going to be having areas of the brain that are involved um, in processing motion, cat, um, it being activated during the process of listening. And that whole field of embodied cognition then um, is really helping us then um, to uh, see the importance, again, of, of how culture is working in this essential way for a very fundamental way that we operate, right? Because simulations for remembering, um, for planning, what am I going to do next? Uh, when you try to imagine what you'll do uh, when the session is over today. Um, there are all kinds of simulations that, that will go by in a flash without you even knowing it until you land on the one that, one or two or three things that you want to think about. Do I do this or do I do that? Um, and so uh, uh, getting into these sorts of um, arenas to actually get under the skin of the, uh, the way these simulations are working uh, with or against folks, I think is another really interesting area um, where uh, neuroscience can be um, helpful. Um, and so uh, here is um, a recent study um, where this was done at UCLA. Uh, and these are all American students at, sorry, at USC. So it's DiMazio's group. Some of you probably know this study. Um, <clears throat> and they used online sources, um, blogs, basically, to get at um, a series of core themes about what's socially acceptable or unacceptable behavior. And they, were, they honed in on a, on a set of uh, 40 um, little scenarios of socially acceptable, uh, sorry, socially unacceptable um, behavior, or questionable, I guess it would be socially questionable, so ethically ambiguous. But what they were trying to do here was also um, tap into different core values. Um, so the, yeah, we all hold you know, a series of um, values about how things should be, right? And um, the cultural models that I was talking about earlier um, also have, and the um, consonant stuff I was talking about, we see the power of um, living up to or not living up to those models. And um, this is what ethics and uh, norms are all about. Um, so there are uh, different sets of core values, uh, ones about um, propriety, about um, respect for others, um, uh, there is sexuality, um, age appropriateness, um, oh, cheating, ec some economic stuff. Um, 
and then they had um, three uh, groups, and here is a good example. I mean, I love Demasio's group, but just look at the section on the participants, because they say they have um, Americans, Chinese, and Iranian. They're all US, U, USC undergraduates. So the Americans are the latent category. You don't know if they're white or black or what they are. Um, but anyway, let's assume, no, we won't assume anything. But they're not Iranian and they're not Chinese. I guess that's what we know. Um, but what, what is really um, interesting is that um, as individuals looked at, um, uh, read these scenarios, um, depending on which core values they, in a previous survey, had ascribed to you know, as most important for them, so that these values that are tapped into with the scenarios, um, <clears throat> they were asked, you know, what's kind of prioritized? What's the most important? Um, and as they read through a scenario that they found to be particularly uh, relevant to a core value for them, this really ramped up the default mode network. So um, it, in other words, in terms of um, that sort of self-reflective, um, uh, very powerful simulation network that is behind the kind of thinking I was just talking about, uh, the more infraction, uh, the more that, that um, core value was, was threatened, um, or the, the more powerful the value was that was threatened, uh, the more activated these areas became. And so, uh, again, uh, that's just one study. It would be really interesting uh, to see what you guys think about ways um, to unpack that. So I'm going to end on a more positive note, because I've been talking a lot about risk and depression and stuff like that. Um, and of course, there's a whole, uh, a, a lot of us, what we're really interested in is human flourishing and how to promote that. Um, and um, either prevent suffering or alleviate it. Um, and so um, I wanted to share this one because, um, which I don't think I put on your readings, um, it, because it sort of combines uh, uh, what I've been saying um, about um, actually the, uh, don't just use the brain as um, a readout for everything that we want to know, that the, um, our bodies um, are processing information all the time. And very often, um, other systems will be telling us things that our conscious minds won't even know is going on. So what people can consciously tell you and what they're aware of is really important. It's way important. But hopefully what I've been showing you, a lot of this stuff is latent. It's not necessarily conscious. And it's working all the time. And so we need not just neuroscience. We need other stuff to get at what's going on and to sort of, and then start to do some really interesting stuff that anthropologists, anyway, have been interested in a long time, which is the sort of, how does that work between what we're conscious of and what we actually think, um, and then what, what we do and what's um, going on um, outside of our consciousness. Um, and how, how do those two things, how does culture work through those um, two, two routes? And so, um, and, and a number of you would know I'm kind of te predisposed to think that way because I've, um, uh, yeah, I trained in neuroscience, but actually because I work in very remote populations for a long time, no way to, to use a scanner or anything like that. So use the body as a lens to understand um, the intersection between uh, person and context. Um, so here, this is work with Brandon Court, who's a transcultural psychiatrist. Um, it was worked in Nepal for a long time. And uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War in Nepal, with funding from UNICEF, it picked up um, a sample of ex-child soldiers matched to never constrict, conscripted peers. So same age, same gender, same village um, in five different districts scattered across um, Nepal. And this is a five-year um, follow-up. Um, and uh, uh, there had been an intervention to um, promote 
uh, reintegration of uh, the kids into their communities, and we were interested in you know, how they were doing five years on. But meanwhile, also we'd met Steve um, Cole, uh, for those of you not familiar with his work. Um, he does, um, I guess you could call it social immunology. Um, that is, uh, he really takes seriously um, the, using the immune system as a way to understand how the body is processing information about um, threat or non-threat. Um, because the immune system uh, is, it permeates our bodies. Um, so it's even better than the immune, uh, than the nervous system in terms of its reach uh, and potently reallocates resources on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Um, and uh, he had worked with Steve Sumi um, on using the rhesus model that Steve um, on early trauma and develop and genetics and gene trauma interaction um, to to um, identify a potential series of markers, immune markers for exposure to trauma. Um, and then I uh, worked that through um, with Teresa Seaman and others at UCLA um, in clinical and then community populations um, to identify what he calls the conserved transcriptional response to adversity. And so this is a profile. Sorry, I should have included that slide, but I didn't. But <clears throat> Um, basically, what you have with the immune system is a whole lot of genetics, right, that's driving um, what the, the immune cells are doing. And so, um, the, the, uh, instead of just looking at one gene, you can look at a whole series of genes and um, see where the immune system is going in terms of is it going into de defensive um, inflammatory mode or not. Um, and it, so I was electrified when I heard a talk from Steve and thought, well, this is really fascinating in terms of then um, how we could try to understand um, how this would play out in this key point. Um, Tom McData and I for many years had argued, and Tom has assembled beautiful data to show the importance of um, ecology and exposures over the early, from early, especially early on in life, and how the immune system functions. And so we, one thing we were interested in was how generalizable was the CTRA? Would we see um, the same kind of inflammatory mobilization to social threat as Steve saw in these Western settings um, in a setting where there's high pathogen and parasite load. So that was just one thing. Um, you know, does, does social context beat out pathogens and parasites um, in, in, in terms of attention from the immune system? And, and then number two, if it does, you know, what insight could it give us into um, these uh, um, ex-child soldiers and their peers and how they were recovering after the war. Um, and so uh, first, what we were kind of surprised, I have to admit, um, surprised to see was that actually the CTRA is present in this population. So it's not that, um, that that set of responses to um, that are linked to social exposures goes away, um, <clears throat> and so it was present, um, and it furthermore behaved the way that we would expect that it would. Um, we used the civilians, so those who had not gone to war, uh, doesn't mean they weren't exposed um, to trauma during the war, but anyway, we used civilians then as our contrast group. And then this is um, how, how uh, much more expressed these um, inflammatory markers are. Um, in child soldiers who had no PTSD, so um, across the board, uh, trauma exposure, um, actually civilian or non-civilian, is associated with increased CTRA, but separating that out, um, if you'd been a child soldier, you had increased levels of CTRA. But if you had PTSD on top of um, being an ex-child soldier, then uh, you had really m massive 
uh, massively higher um, CTRA expressions. So you get the reanimation of those experiences um, is is driving um, is, is driving this basically inflammatory response. So I think you can begin to sort of imagine the story that people are thinking about in terms of really needing to track what's going on with what's driving inflammatory responses um, <clears throat> and um, uh, how that may play through in terms of the, uh, the kind of mental uh, illness stuff that you're interested in. But um, here's another thing, a lesson in humility also. Um, I was a student of Arthur Kleinman, so I have a permanent lifetime cynicism, I guess I would put it, about cross-cultural measures of anything, probably. Um, and so, I mean, I've slowly got into, you know, studying depression and things like that. But um, uh, in talking with the kids, the, the, the field staff, you know, listening to them, what's they were saying, uh, Bram said, yeah, this sounds a lot like resilience. It sounds a lot like some of these resilience measures I've been hearing about. And um, so he pulled out um, one of the standard resilience measures. And I'm like, yeah, oh, this is crap. We, I mean, you know, we, we translated in the sense of the standard way of that it would be interpretable and, and tweaked it a bit for local um, salience. Um, but we just plug that in because um, both of us are interested in, in positive ways, you know, how uh, to, to, uh, toward coping. And uh, to pro our profound amazement, uh, this is re resilience measure, um, was a huge uh, moderator of the CTRA response. So um, these are former child soldiers with PTSD. So, so they meet all the former criteria for PTSD. Um, but you can see there's a clear uh, dose response um, in CTRA, where resilience, the greater the resilience, um, the lower the CTRA till you reach the point where there's, there's no, no difference uh, between the civilian um, baseline. And th this was, um, at least to me, um, pretty amazing. And so um, what we're interested in now is sort of taking the components of that and to ask the important question of, you know, these are obviously not traits necessarily that these individuals have. Where did this resilience come from? What is it that they're really talking about? And then what was interesting here was that um, there, were, there were two things in the resilience uh, index that that seem to be um, key. One is this sort of sense that you have there's meaning and purpose in your life. And again, that sounds pretty corny, but you know, this matters. So, um, and when people are, are uh, often when we're talking about deprivation, some of the deprivation is really a challenge of meaning as much as anything else, perhaps. And then the other is um, self-efficacy. So a sense that I'm in charge of with my world. I can guide my own actions. Again, our question then becomes, where does that come from? Um, but here, to me, is an interesting example of how um, we now, a biomarker has drawn our attention to a set of dynamics that we were like, I don't know how to study resilience, but, but we still don't quite know how to study resilience, but we have some better ideas and we can go back and start digging under the skin of that to understand what's going on. So, um, ho hopefully, um, when we talk about G by E, what I've been trying to convince you of is that it's actually B by C and it's been there all along. That it's biology and culture, it's biology and context, it's in, it's baked in. It's by design. And so it's up to us to figure out what, what each of these, what are the dynamics and how is that working. I've used development and embodiment as sort of core touchstones here to give us some examples. Um, and also tried to convince you that um, that we, it's, the exciting thing is we moved way beyond categorical thinking. We still use categories because we have to, that's how language works. Um, but to really focus on processes um, 
has helped us then to see, and I, I think neuroscience also is helping us to see some of the dynamics involved that, that then have shared components but get instantiated to, in localized ways to produce um, localized outcomes. And uh, hopefully this is going to allow us to uh, better trace pathways to differential well-being. So that's, um, uh, we've got like a few minutes or not? Yeah, we have, uh, My clock is behind, I think. Two minutes. Oh, man. Two minutes. So OK. Well, yeah. Comments, questions. Yes. First of all, thank you for this interesting presentation. Um, so you, uh, with regards to um, studies on embodiment, hmm. you cited some uh, work on uh, that looks at how uh, social factors influence uh, biological process. I want to ask if you know of any studies in anthropology that uh, examines, uh, that uses uh, direct neuroscience measures. Um, are there any studies, um, for instance, that looks at how, uh, for example, uh, early socialization practices, mm -hmm. parenting models, mm -hmm. how they relate to brain function? Uh, and if there are, what kind of uh, techniques, uh, measurements they use. Mm. And also, I think it would be interesting to think about this, how you des uh, describe it, the general process relation between general processes and localized outcomes, mm. particularly in, uh, uh, in a problem area like uh, uh, parenting, mm. early socialization, mm. and how um, cultural uh, variation in parenting Mm. affects uh, child brain maturation. Mm. Uh, are there any work that people are more interested yeah. in theoretically, but also in terms of uh, innovative yeah. Yes, um, and these are all wonderful questions. I hope we all hold these uh, in mind as we go forward. Um, uh, Sarah Harkness and Charlie Super have done this sort of work for years in terms of looking specifically at parenting practices and then differential outcomes. Um, but no, uh, I think Charlie, so he would be your person potentially um, because I think he was partnering with people at there at University of Connecticut and was partnering at people with people in the medical school at Hartford. Uh, and I know they were looking at cortisol, and I thought they were going to do some psychophysiology, and I'm not sure. But Charlie would be, um, he's a developmental psychologist, and, and um, I think you would find um, the work relevant and some of the models that they developed relevant. Um, I bet, so I'm, I'm not aware of outside of the US. Um, is anybody, I mean, we have a brain trust here, <laughs> if anyone is aware of such work. But I mean, here is a really interesting, uh, because for example, um, uh, we were, you know, we, uh, we talk a lot about executive function, and uh, we sort of know what that looks like in the brain, and we know how um, emotion and executive function interact to a certain degree. But then um, to look at different socialization practices, even within, I've often been fascinated by gender differences. That's why I showed you the Rilling study, you know, boys and girls, it could be, in, you know, they're in the same society or they are even in the same household. How do different, even subtle differences, but sometimes very large differences in socialization practices lead to quite different state regulatory outcomes? It's a huge deal in South Africa because, anyway, there's, yeah, there's very different treatment of boys and girls vis-a-vis -vis acting out in violence and, and so forth that has long-term consequences for the guys themselves and, and women. Yeah, Connie. I just wondered if you did you Ancestor Sterling's work? That's right. Yeah, no, talk about it. Oh. Yeah. No. Well, I think that Ancestor Sterling's work on going to civilization, but it's this gender, it's based on gender, but, but she's a biologist of American biology. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a good one. Yeah. 
Well, I should let you all go to lunch. And thank you for a good morning. I look forward to more good conversations. We'll be back at 2 o'clock.